Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. It's Sunday the 1st of May. I'm Andrew Wilson and this is The Full Scottish. This afternoon, first of all, I have the daily news update from Ukraine on day 67 of the illegal Russian invasion. Then I'll introduce our guest for today and then together we will take a longer look at the past week's headlines from Scotland and around the world. The UK Foreign Office said today that Russia was using a troll factory to spread disinformation about the war in Ukraine on social media and to target politicians across a number of countries, including the UK and South Africa. Twenty wounded civilians were able to evacuate from the besieged Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol and were likely on their way to, on their way to Zaporizhia. Satellite images show that nearly all of the buildings of the plant have been destroyed. Ukraine has carried out a prisoner exchange with Russia, with seven soldiers and seven civilians coming home. One of the soldiers, who was a woman, who was said to be five months pregnant, according to Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister, Irina Vereshchuk. She did not say how many Russians had been transferred. On Thursday, Ukraine said Russia had handed over 33 soldiers. The Hollywood actor and UN humanitarian envoy Angelina Jolie made a surprise visit to the western Ukrainian city of Lviv on Saturday, the regional governor said on Telegram. The mayor of Mariupol said that the Russian military had killed twice as many of the citizens, city's residents in the two months of the war as Nazi Germany did in two years of occupation during the Second World War. Ukrainian police found the bodies of three civilian men in the Bucha district north of Kyiv tied up and in some cases gagged, the regional police chief said. He said the bodies were found to have several gunshot wounds and showed signs of torture. Russian troops may have been forced to merge and redeploy units from their failed advances in Ukraine's northeast, according to the UK's Ministry of Defence. Ukraine's military has estimated that 23,200 Russian soldiers had been killed since the beginning of the invasion when Ukrainian prosecutors said they had recorded more than 8,000 war crimes by Russian troops and were investigating 10 Russian soldiers for suspected atrocities in Bucha, which is near Kyiv. Russia has said that the risks of nuclear war should be kept to a minimum, according to its TASS news agency. Uh, the... Uh, my apologies. According to its TASS news agency, however, the great granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, Khrushchev, who is Nina Khrushcheva, has warned that Russia and the West are nearer to nuclear war than during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Russian forces have stolen several hundred thousand tons of grain in the areas of Ukraine they occupy, according to Ukraine's deputy agriculture minister. A Russian missile strike on Odessa airport has damaged the runway, rendering it unusable, but there were no re casualties reported. And Russia bombarded Ukraine's second city, Kharkiv, as part of its renewed push in the east of the country, while claiming that the draft of a possible treaty between the two countries was being discussed on a daily basis. Now, we are lucky enough today to be joined this afternoon by the SNP MP for Glasgow North, Carol Monaghan. Carol was a physics teacher at schools in Glasgow uh, and has worked in many Glasgow comprehensive schools, including 14 years at Hindland Secondary as the head of physics and head of science. She spent two years as a, at a Glasgow University lecturer training future teachers. She was also an SQA consultant and Carol has been involved in developing physics qualifications at a national level. Uh, she won Glasgow North in 2015 from uh, Labour's John Robertson. Following the 2017 general election, she was appointed the SNP's Westminster spokesperson on education, armed forces and veterans. And she currently sits on the House of Commons Science, Te Science and Technology Select Committee. And so Carol, in many ways, is ideally qualified to join us and talk to us about a number of the stories that we're going to discuss this afternoon. Carol, how are you keeping this afternoon? I'm very well, thanks, Andrew. Um, enjoying the, the break in the rain today because obviously we need to get out and campaign. So uh, yesterday was a bit damp. Campaigning in the rain is never fun, but it's something that we have to do. That's a, that's a, a common feature of campaigning in Scotland. But uh, thank you very much for taking a little bit of time out from your day and from campaigning and from dealing with your uh, mailbox uh, to come and join us on the Full Scottish Today. Thanks, Carol. 
Yeah. Firstly, Carol, uh, we'll, 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 we'll look at a story from, uh, from Westminster, uh, uh, which, as I say, you're ideally qualified to comment and help us with. Uh, there were reports in the press today that the Speaker of the House of Commons wants a conference to plan what he calls radical action. Uh, and a former leader of the House of Commons, Andrea Leadsom, uh, has said that she wants uh, less drinking and a bigger HR department. Now, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, you've been an MP since 2015. What's your reflection on the issues that you've experienced with the operation of the House of, Law, House of Commons, in particular as a, as a, as a woman MP? Uh, uh, what's your experience and, and what would you change? Yeah, it's it's quite a it's quite an odd workplace, I think, for anybody that spends any time in Parliament. Um, I've come from a profession where people work extremely hard throughout the day. They go home to their families, and um, you know sometimes they're working in the evening as well, of course. But you you go from that sort of typical work day to a work day that doesn't follow that pattern, first of all. So your my work day typically can start as early as eight, it can start as late as 11, um, but it can start as early as eight with breakfast meetings and it can go pr on pretty much as late as it has to do. Now the Scottish Parliament is far better and is, is far better at looking at the constraints of the working day, but Westminster doesn't have those constraints. And particularly when you have a lot of votes happening and happening late into the night, there are a lot of MPs, a lot of staff, a lot of people hanging about, often bored because they're waiting for an hour for a vote that's happening maybe at 11 o'clock at night. And inevitably, people turn to drink. Um, and uh, we're starting to see some of, the, some of the impacts of this. So I think, first of all, Everything that we are seeing and everything that that's having a light shone on it just now in terms of Westminster, I think could be improved by having a more normal working day within the Palace of Westminster. But I don't see any appetite for that happening. I think I think most most MPs, certainly your traditional Tory, is quite happy to carry on the way the way that we are at the moment. Thanks, Carol. It's an interesting point that you make with regard to the drinking, just briefly, and I'm not going to focus on that, uh, although you've identified that it is a, it is a feature, and I can't remember how many bars there are now in the, house, in the Houses of Par on, the, on the Parliamentary Estate, but there are many. Uh, uh, and I'm, it just it struck me as you were talking about it, we've got a history of MPs, right, even including from Scotland, uh, encountering difficulty as a result of drink. I'm thinking of Eric Joyce, uh, whose travails uh, go back as before 2013 uh, in terms of uh, difficulty arising. Uh, uh, but this will tie back to a, a question that I'll, I'll ask you in a moment. But do you think, is it simply a, a case that we need to restrict the, sell the, the availability of, of alcohol on the, on the parliamentary estate? Um, I th I th Probably that should be considered. I mean, it's not it's not unusual to see MPs and staff who have overconsumed alcohol still hanging about. So I think in some other bars they might be told to to go home. Um, whereas in Westminster that that doesn't necessarily happen. I do think though that you know there should be an opportunity to to enjoy a sensible drink. At work, I mean, if I'm if I'm sitting late for Parliament, I might have a meal and I might have a glass of wine, or I might meet somebody for a drink in a bar. I, I might do that. Um, so, I think it's it's difficult because of the nature of it and because of how long really you're confined there every evening. It's it's very difficult to say right, we're taking that thing away because sometimes sometimes a a, a small drink is what actually gets you through some of the stuff that goes on. However, what we're talking about is not people drinking responsibly. We're not talking about people having a you know a glass of wine with their dinner. We're talking about overconsumption of alcohol and um, and the problems therein. Um, you talked about the number of bars in the place. I'm not sure how many bars there actually are because probably I've, I've not been to them all. In fact, I, I definitely haven't been to them all. So it's difficult to know how many places there are within Westminster where one can, can buy and consume alcohol. But there, there are plenty of opportunities, let's just say. Of course, thank you. I'll, uh, I think there are 23 points of sale for meals and drinks, of which eight have licenses to sell, provide alcohol, according to The Guardian. Uh, and, I've, and so, I've definitely, can I say I've definitely not been in all of them then? <laughs> 
Absolutely right. No, no, no. That's not the point. Uh, uh, look, uh, we'll come back to uh, the issue, perhaps, of taking things away in a moment. Uh, but I was going to ask you a, a slip, perhaps a more reflective question about these issues. We've had a we've had a, a week where the conduct of MPs and the the apparent environment uh, of misogyny and uh, abuse. Uh, in in a number of ways have been headline news uh, for whatever reason uh, or reasons during this week uh, and it certainly prompted me and others to begin to perhaps to reflect a little bit more and a little bit more deeply it crossed my mind that really at the heart of these issues that we've seen in the press this week uh, uh, in terms of the reporting in the mail of Sunday with regard to Angela Rayner last week uh, the resignation yesterday of the Tory MP the Tory Devon MP, uh, for watching porn on, on his phone in the in while waiting to vote, uh, 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 on, on at least that occasion, if not more, uh, I was I was caused to reflect that perhaps at its heart these issues seem to be more about rather deeper issues than uh, uh, certain people uh, either overindulging or not being able to hold their drink. Uh, deeper issues round about entitlement, uh, round about respect. Uh, perhaps one rule for politicians or one rule for Tory politicians uh, and a different rule for the rest of us. Uh, and perhaps it was even deeper than that. I was perhaps reflecting it was about male entitlement, male respect issues uh, and different rules for men. Uh, if, uh, is, uh, do you think, is that is that a reasonable uh, approach, a reasonable cause for concern? And, if it, and if, it, if it is, how do we start to break the chains of infection to get away from uh, these issues of, regarding entitlement and respect and, and rule breaking? There are so many aspects to this. I mean, if I, if I give a few examples of, of things that I've experienced or certainly witnessed, um, the sense of entitlement runs deep. Uh, amongst Tory MPs, particularly male Tory MPs. Um, for many of them, many of them have come from a certain type of school. They've gone to a certain type of university and they come to Westminster that reminds them of all of that. You know, it's the same type of building. It's grand. It's um, people serve them their dinners. People call them sir. Um, all of that. So the sense of entitlement that's already ingrained is enhanced by by their um, appearance at Westminster. That's that's first first and foremost. And I was aware of it almost instantly upon being elected. But I don't know if um, some of the viewers might remember an incident. And it was um, shortly after I was elected in 2015. And um, Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh was was talking, and Taz, as Tasmina was talking, Nicholas Soames, who was sitting in the front row opposite, barked at her, um, literally barked, a, a, which he seemed to think was an appropriate way to to heckle a female MP who was speaking. I'd never seen that before or since that that kind of attitude was taken but it shows you that he was he thought so little not just of what she was saying but who of who was saying it that he felt that that was that was an appropriate way to conduct himself um but there are so many other examples the the new intake of Tory MPs in 2019 a lot of these were very young MPs they were MPs that weren't necessarily expecting to be elected as I mean, I suppose some of some of the SNP MPs in 20, 2015 would have been young and not expecting to be elected. There was quite a difference in attitude. However, these young MPs that came in, they came in acting, and it's it's. I always say in a new in a new job, you keep your eyes open, you keep your ears open, and you keep your mouth shut. shut. Well, they seem to they seem to have the opposite. Their mouth was was going constantly, and they were particularly aggressive. Now, I, there was an incident with one of them when I I was in. And I was in a bar and I was having a drink with a couple of colleagues, including a Tory MP, by the way, because often we do chat to other other parties in the the pub. And he started being incredibly aggressive towards me. When I went up and challenged him on this and said, what's what's going on? He started going on about the speech I had made earlier that day, how he thought it was shock, a shocking speech, how he hadn't enjoyed it, how it was very long. Um, I was speaking from the front bench, so I was entitled to speak for as long as I had wanted to. But he seemed to think that I had taken too long in my speech and was incredibly aggressive to, to me, um, to such an extent that some other Tory MPs 
had to then tackle him on this. But the problem with this is when you have MPs coming in with that attitude, that attitude then spills over to staff as well. And another incident where I was chatting to about six Tory staffers, somebody had introduced me, um, was a friend of one and wanted to introduce me. They introduced me to these six Tory, Tory staffers who thought this was an ideal opportunity to try out their debating skills on a female MP. And all six of them went, I, I wasn't able to finish a sentence. I wasn't able to make a point when I had them, all of them got, eventually I walked away. And what I said to them was, did they think that six male MPs ganging, or six male, um, male members of staff ganging up on a single female was an appropriate way to conduct themselves? And of course, some of them kind of a couple of them realised that it had been highly inappropriate and others laughed and joked as I, as I left them to it. So the problem is that, that that kind of misogyny, that sense of entitlement, when we see it so strongly amongst MPs, it then spills over into other staffs as well. And that causes problems for not just for MPs, but it causes problems for anybody working in Parliament. So there's a huge, there is a huge problem. I mean, in terms of the Tory MP watching whatever he was watching. I'm not going to make a moral judgment. What I am going to say, however, is to do that in front of females is where the problem for me. I mean, we can talk about the morals of, of porn and, and the abuse that women may suffer as a result of that. But, but really, if any of my colleagues thought it was appropriate to watch porn whilst I was, I was close to them, I would be tackling them on this and I think certainly they should be in any in any job in any situation somebody doing that where females are then exposed to that um should be tackled and it's it's right that he has resigned um he should have been kicked out if he hadn't been that's a very fair point Carol and certainly the the the, the point you're making about conduct at work uh, 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 is right uh, I think for for most of us who who are who are in employment but are not uh, are, are have not been elected, uh, we we would we would be subject to policies, written policies normally, but certainly we would expect in the event that we were uh, we were watching uh, watching porn or anything which is prohibited in terms of a work policy, we would be sacked. It's as simple as that. Uh, I think many of us know uh, former colleagues who uh, found themselves in situations like that. Uh, from time to time over the last 20 years since the internet became such a huge part of our lives. Uh, so there's maybe a little bit of uh, uh, confusion on the part of, of voters insofar as apparently, as I say, there's, there's, a, there's a sense there of uh, uh, workers, uh, taxpayers, would be sacked if they indulged in this. Uh, Mr Parrish, on the other hand, has the opportunity to reflect uh, and to give an interview to his local BBC channel, his local BBC news organisation, and then in due course resign. However, as you say, we're not here to talk about him and we're not here to talk about that. I, particular do, I do issue. want to... I I do just want to say, though, um, never have I found myself looking up something and inadvertently, I mean, I've, I've never found myself looking up tractor websites, I've got to say, but I've never found myself inadvertently finding myself watching porn. So I, I do find, uh, I think his excuse was rather thin. It's a, 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 well, well, indeed. Uh, and it's a curious thing, tractors, it's been a point's been made a couple of times this morning on other channels that uh, tractors seem to form a, such a huge part of our lives now, given the role of Ukrainian farmers in their part in the defence of their country, uh, using tractors to uh, increase the size of the Ukrainian army and reduce the size of the Russian army. Uh, but uh, it is a curiosity that tractors uh, are, are such a large thing. There's one last aspect to this I was going to raise with you, uh, and I was really thinking about, uh, because I knew you were coming on this morning and, and, and thinking of you your long experience in, as an educator in the teaching professions. A couple of stories connected in my head yesterday when I was thinking about this a little bit. Uh, firstly, we know that, uh, and, I, and I'd be interested to, to have your reflection on this, and I'm not making light of it, but I, I do think there may be something in this. Uh, we know that uh, the use of mobile phones in schools is controversial for some people from time to time, uh, and some, some elements of the press make an issue of it from time to time, saying that mobile phones are a bad thing in the hands of children at school, young people at school, and that phones should be banned from schools. Uh, we also saw today that there's, there are reports that 11 secondary school head teachers in Wales uh, have written to parents saying that the conduct of their pupils has deteriorated during the pandemic, during lockdown, when young people were not in school. Uh, and as a result, they're seeing examples of uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, detrimental behaviour, uh, which was including the things like vaping in school, swearing, uh, and that, and vandalism. Uh, so we've seen, with regard to the way in which young people are regarded, uh, there is hand wringing in the in the press from time to time with regard to their behaviour, and the deterioration in their standards, and that something should be done, and the, and there's an implication that these young people should be punished. Uh, in the context, uh, now I appreciate entirely that, uh, and it, it's it's the same as we were just discussing. Uh, MPs are perfectly entitled and should use uh, tablets and phones in connection with their work. Nobody's arguing against that, uh, and, and nor, th nor should they. However, it strikes me that there are suggestions that, uh, because of the risk of misbehaviour, uh, phones and tablets should be taken away from young people when they're at school, what you might say is the equivalent of their place of work, uh, and, and also that, uh, uh, that young people's behaviour has deteriorated recently and that, they should, that their behaviour should improve, either through punishment or, or, or by some other means. So I'm wondering, uh, would, it, would you be surprised if some voters are starting to think that uh, we should begin to treat some MPs as we, as we treat our children insofar as limiting, limiting their access to phones and tablets except when they're, they're at work, uh, and perhaps punishing them until their behaviour significantly improves, perhaps no more trips for certain MPs until they can behave. Yeah, I think I think that would it probably quite a difficult one to to police and to monitor. Um, and and you've got to remember as well that actually a lot of the time I will use my tablet in the chamber because I'm stuck in there for seven or eight hours. Maybe if I want to speak in a particular debate, and I can actually catch up in emails. I can catch up in correspondence with constituents. Otherwise, it's seven or eight hours wasted. That's not to say that every time I'm on my phone or my tablet in the chamber, it's work related. I might be messaging my kids to check if they've got to their after school activities okay or whatever else. So um, I, I think it would be quite a difficult one to to monitor. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure how you would do that. Uh, however, lots of schools have um, sort of a firewalls put in that prevent their pupils accessing particular web pages. So maybe that would be a better thing to do. You can access your emails, you can access certain web pages, news um, articles, for example. But uh, if you want to look up tractor websites, possibly you have to do that in your own time. Um, but what I, what I would also say is, Going back to the young people in schools, I actually think that mobile phones used well and at certain points of time within a classroom situation can be a really useful tool. For example, um, I might want in a physics class to be doing measurements, timing measurements, and the easiest thing in the world is to take out a mobile phone and use a stop clock on it. Um, so for example, or I might want a quick piece of information that youngsters could Google very quickly. That said, that has to be monitored very closely. And when a teacher said mobile phones in bags, that's where they remain. So I think you need to strike a balance that if the teacher sees them as having a value to, to the lesson, then I, 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 I don't have a problem with that at all. But I think restriction of websites might be quite useful in Parliament. Thanks, Carol. I think I, I can't disagree with anything that you're saying there. And I think that the, there are there are technical technological means which the rest of the planet applies quite successfully in the Parliament. I know I can suspect that one or two Luddites uh, or those MPs uh, or members of the House who are I heard this morning on other channels being described as Luddites uh, might re might resist both technological controls and also, as you say, the the move to perhaps uh, a, a working a place of work and working practices which are maybe twentieth century, not twenty first century. That would be perhaps too big of a leap. Uh, but making making those changes, but uh, we we hope that the the changes can be made and that 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 the working environment for everybody improves in the in 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 par in, in the Westminster Parliament. But we've 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 looked at that uh, for a while this this afternoon. So I'd like to move to another uh, Westminster parliamentary story, uh, and that is with the prorogation on, of Parliament at the end of last week. Uh, there were a couple of pieces of legislation which squeaked through uh, by, a, by a variety of means, and, and we've spoken about them during the week. Uh, however, the one that I was going to talk to you about this afternoon uh, is the is the elections bill uh, and some some fairly fundamental reforms of the way in which elections are. Uh, are governed uh, uh, under under the Westminster system. 
uh, I, I'm looking at a letter that was written by the entire Electoral Commission, with one exception, uh, to uh, Michael Gove and two other ministers on the 21st of February as the, as the elections bill entered its House of Lords stages. Uh, I, as I say, this letter was signed collectively by the entire commission, uh, with the exception of one Tory commissioner who was uh, talking about the legislation in the House of Lords and so she couldn't sign this letter. Uh, they said that it is our firm and shared view that the introduction of a strategy and policy statement enabling the government to guide the work of the commission is inconsistent with the role of an independent commission and it plays in a healthy democracy. This independence is fundamental to maintaining confidence and legitimacy in our electoral system. If made law, these provisions will enable our government in the future to influence the Commission's operational functions and decisions. This includes its oversight and enforcement of the political finance regime, but also the advice and guidance it provides to electoral administrators, parties and campaigners, and its work on voter registration. The statement would place a duty on the Commission to have regard to the government strategy and policy priorities and to help the government to meet those government priorities. Now, the uh, issues that the Commission was writing about there are now law. Uh, Royal Assent was granted on Thursday, I think. Uh, so, uh, thinking about this in a, in a general sense, for, uh, first of all, why are the government's priorities being put ahead uh, of voters' priorities in terms of the way in which elections are governed? Yeah, I suppose because they've got the majority to do so. <laughs> that is, that, that, and we would argue that there are questions about the legality of this, but um, ultimately they've they've been able to push through all sorts of pretty. Um, a regressive legislation as a result of the huge majority that the Tories are sitting with just now. Um, one of the arguments they used in terms of the, the elections bill was a, that they were hoping to stop voter fraud. Now, voter fraud happens in a tiny number of cases, and yet there are very few examples where you can actually point out that there has been an incident of voter fraud taking place. So it's it's not something that, uh, that really should drive this. The bigger issue has always been getting people out to vote. And of course, what has happened through this elections bill is that those who are less likely to go out and vote anyway have had an additional hurdle put in, in their place. And of course, it is only going to benefit one party, and that's the Tory party. Um, so it is problematic. It is actually an assault on democracy. Thanks, Carol. Uh, uh, certainly, there are significant issues in there in terms of the the, the attacks a, attack on on our democracy and on our the political system that that supports our our democracy. Uh, uh, in in addition to the voter registration point, the Commission touched on. Uh, the enforcement of the political finance regime in their letter back on the 21st of February. Uh, it struck me that uh, Michael Gove was very much uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Vote Leave uh, campaign in 2016. And of course, the Vote Leave campaign broke electoral law at the time. Uh, it, it funneled uh, almost £700,000 of dodgy financing into their campaign, uh, for which they were ultimately fined £61,000 by the Electoral Commission. Uh, uh, do you think it's a problem that apparently now Michael Gove, who was respo who was involved in the breaking of electoral law in 2016 uh, and illegal campaign financing, will now be able to tell the Electoral Commission what it can and can't do? Of, of course, it's a problem. I mean, it's it's, uh, but it's not a surprise. Um, but the, I think though the the point you've just made about the level of spending and the level of fine. Um, shows that even though the Vote Leave campaign did break electoral law, they may have taken that as, we'll just assume that that extra 60,000 that we're going to be fined or that potentially we could be fined, we'll just consider that part of our spending anyway because we're going to be hit with that. Um, it, the fine is, is tiny compared to the overspend. And we certainly know, and, and I've got to say, the Lib Dems are, are infamous for it, huge overspends that they then pretend are a, a national, part of a national campaign that only seems to be targeting a particular, uh, a couple of seats. Um, so we know that they're, they're notorious for it. And uh, 
yet they do it time and time again. So um, it seems as though parties can do what they want if they've got the money there to do it regardless. So um, I'm not sure in terms of the finance for this is going to make any difference. Uh, and, you know, as they did what they wanted anyway. So, um, but it's another indication of how undemocratic and how... Um, problematic the legislation is that this Tory government is continuing to push through. I'm sure we, I'm sure we can expect another few whoppers in the Queen's speech, which will be in a couple of weeks' time. I suspect you're absolutely right, Carol. Uh, I, I'm afraid to say I live in one of the two constituencies you were thinking about there, uh, so I've been uh, delighted by the campaign material for a, lo for a local election that's come through the door, including late last night. Uh, but we'll move on to our next story, uh, if we may, uh, and that's in the context of one of the other pieces of legislation that uh, that beat the guillotine uh, with the proroguing of Parliament last week, and that's the Nationality and Borders Bill. Uh, I've got a statement here from the uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, a statement that, uh, that he made on the 27th. Uh, he said that the, uh, today the UK Parliament approved new legislation on nationality, asylum and immigration. The bill will become law once it receives royal assent. It has now received royal assent. Uh, the UNHCR regrets the British government's proposals for a new approach to asylum that undermines established international refugee protection law and practices and that it has been approved. The UK is a nation that rightly prides itself on its history of welcoming and protecting refugees. It is disappointing that it would choose a new course of action aimed at deterring the seeking of asylum by relegating most refugees to a new, lesser status with few rights and a constant threat of removal. Furthermore, wide-ranging inadmissibility rules have the potential to deny refugees their right to seek asylum in the UK. Such provisions are potentially at variance with the Refugee Convention. I'm also concerned that the UK's intention to externalise its obligations to protect refugees and asylum seekers to other countries. Such efforts to shift responsibility run counter to the letter and spirit of the Refugee Convention to which the UK is a party. These efforts also run counter to the Global Compact on Refugees, which was affirmed by the UN General Assembly in 2018 and calls for more equitably sharing the responsibility for refugee protection. This latest UK government decision risks dramatically weakening in a system that has for decades provided protection and the chance of a new life to so many desperate people. Uh, so why do you think is it, Carol, that the, the, the Tory Westminster government is doing something which the UN, UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, sorry, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, criticises so widely and so fundamentally? First of all, I think we have to dial the clock back a few years. And um, if we do so, we see that um, in the lead up to the Brexit vote and following that vote, we saw a rise in hard right British nationalism. Um, so first of all, that's that's if that if we have that as kind of setting the scene. When we approached the 2019 general election, it was clear that in order to be successful, the Tories were going to have to out UKIP, UKIP. Um, there were a certain number of seats where UKIP could have been could have been problematic for the Tories. And actually, they've managed not just to out UKIP, UKIP, but to set a new low bar in terms of their attitudes and rhetoric towards refugees. Um, this is, I mean, if you if you think back to Cameron's government, we we had that horrible headline the swarm of migrants we had um we had talk in the in the chamber about how these people were you know were a threat to us um and a threat to our society so that's all that's kind of all set the scene and of course if you don't have political leadership if you don't have strong messages coming from those at the top then of course that filters down it filter we see it in right wing media and it becomes normal chat pub chat or work chat amongst members of the public can i say very thankfully that's not been the case in scotland and um, i was really heartened when the nationalities and borders bill was going through parliament about the level of correspondence I had from constituents. And I can say with all honesty, I didn't get one email asking me to vote for this legislation, but I had hundreds of emails 
telling me to oppose it in the strongest possible terms. Now, I don't think my constituency is untypical in Scotland. I think this is a fairly, um, I think this would reflect the views of the Scottish people, that we don't share that hard right British nationalism, that we don't share that that fear and, and aggression towards those who who seek safety in another country. So that, and I think with the, the, the events of last year when we saw two, two people in the south side of Glasgow um, been, it, trying, been lifted by the Home Office with a, a view to being deported, we saw the strength of feeling um, with members of the public and the community came out to support and, and those individuals were able to stay. Um, so I think there is a real, a real difference in outlook but it's hard to kind of overstate how toxic it is. You, you've mentioned the 1951 Refugee Convention, which of course the UK is a signed up is signed up to, and the fact that UNHCR reckon that this this um, refugees and um, nationalities and borders act as it is now is contravening that. I think is quite. Um, is quite telling. I actually raised this in the chamber last week and the response was something along the lines of, well, this is what the British people are wanting. Well, it's not what my constituents want and I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not what constituents um, generally across Scotland want. And it's important that people in my position and, and people in positions of leadership, whatever walk of life they're in, continue to talk about this and continue to talk about the positive contribution that um, immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, other people who choose to come and make their home here in Scotland, about the positive contribution they have made to our, to our cities, our towns and our communities, because that they certainly have. Thanks, Carol. You're, you've been talking there about uh, the the difference, perhaps uh, your perception and the difference that we think is is between uh, the electorate in in England and Wales and and the electorate in Scotland. Uh, and I was going to look at uh, a, a Scottish aspect to this uh, this story with, with you as well, uh, because the SNP's Shadow Home Secretary, your colleague Stuart Macdonald MP, uh, who's the MP for Cumbernauld, Kilsyth, and Kirkintilloch, uh, has slammed the bills, uh, the the plans to criminalise and imprison refugees and asylum seekers, claiming that proposals made them the latest victims of an ever-growing list of broken Tory promises. Uh, so there's both the fundamental abhorrence of the way in which the Tory government are apparently determined to break uh, the various conventions that the UK is party to in terms of its treatment of refugees and asylum seekers. There's abhorrence at the, at the attitude and the hosti hostility shown by Tory politicians towards those seeking refuge and asylum. Uh, and there's this, now, this additional aspect that Stuart MacDonald has identified with regard to this being Tory uh, manifesto promise breaking. Uh, Mr Macdonald said the 2019 Tory manifesto contained a commitment to protecting refugees and granting asylum to those facing persecution and oppression. It made no mention of offshoring or offloading responsibility onto developing countries to which they have absolutely no connection. By riding roughshod over the Re Refugee Convention and their own manifesto promises, it seems clear that the latest victims of an ever-growing list of broken Tory promises appears to be the people they once pledged to protect people fleeing unimaginable horrors and persecution. So in ter uh, putting, uh, having looked at the abhorrence of Tory policies, uh, should we be surprised uh, at, at this Tory government, uh, in addition to being abhorrent, also breaking manifesto promises? Oh, I, don't, I don't think anything surprises us about this, this Tory government. Um, we can look on with disbelief, we can look on with horror, we can kind of pinch ourselves and say, is this actually happening in the UK in 2022? Is this how we consider the this global Britain that we are um, unfortunately still part of? Is this what how we consider our responsibilities to some of the most vulnerable people on the planet? But unfortunately, um, this is how they consider their their responsibilities and they're not they're not worried about breaking manifesto uh, promises and in fact they're reveling in this particular bill some of the things that were said some of the attitudes as it was passing were were, were simply um indescribable you you can't 
for us here, I mean, I'm in Glasgow. I, I, I just don't understand it. It has, it, it is so alien to me their attitude that I, um, I struggle to to comprehend what's going on. But it's interesting. One of the things they keep, they, they'll say that they're trying to protect these individuals from the people traffickers. They'll talk about trying to protect them from small boats in the in the channel. Now, if they were trying to protect them the small boats in the channel, they would be patrolling and lifting them and bringing them to safety here in the UK. They wouldn't be slamming them up in detention centres as is happening just now. I haven't been to a detention centre, but I know some of my colleagues have, including uh, my colleague Alison Hewless, and she talks about it with horror, some of the conditions that people are, are subjected to in these detention centres. Um, you know, lazy rhetoric, we hear about, oh, refugees get lovely houses and cars and jobs and everything else. That's simply not the case. For the majority of those seeking asylum, it is the, it, their experience is brutal, it's harsh. And, um, you know, for a country that's supposed to be leading the way in human rights, we, we have to think very carefully about, about what that's. But again, I'll say the people of England voted for this. This is what they wanted, and I don't think I don't think they should be surprised when they vote for a person like Boris Johnson, with a Home Secretary like Priti Patel. I don't think they should be surprised when they get legislation such as this been pushed through. Absolutely, Carol. Thank you. No, none of us are surprised. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, let's move on to another story, though. Uh, something that's close, I think, to your heart in a number of ways, uh, uh, and that is that uh, in evidence being taken by the Science and Technology uh, Committee that of, of, of which you are a member, uh, they were told this week that girls do not choose physics A levels because girls dislike hard maths. Uh, now. Uh, uh, that's been it's been co commented on a few times this week, and uh, it, it was a cause of some consternation even on my part. However, I know that you raised a point of order in the House of Commons uh, with regard to this during the week before Parliament rose, uh, and I think we've got a clip of that point of order now. Oh, and Carol Monaghan's is related to this. I'll take. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further to that point of order, can can we put on record because it is we are very short in terms of this session that physics is something that girls tend to fancy, yeah, yeah, yeah. that physics is something that they do want to do, that, that they do like it, that the maths in it they enjoy and excel in, and this House supports yeah, their yeah. options yeah, in yeah. this. Yeah. Well, it says it's obviously not a point of order, but it's... <laughs> uh, so Lindsay Hoyle uh, doing what he does, uh, does best there uh, in terms of uh, deflecting from the point. Uh, so, Carol, the background to this is uh, evidence that was given to MPs during the week by Catherine Burbal, Burbal Singh. Uh, she said that girls do not choose physics because they dislike hard maths. Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, Catherine Bur 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 Burbal Singh is the government's social mobility commissioner. Uh, addressing your committee, uh, an inquiry on diversity and inclusion in STEM subjects, uh, she said that fewer girls choose physics because physics isn't something that girls tend to fancy. They don't want to do it. They don't like it, she said. Now, she's a head teacher of the uh, Michaela Community School in Wembley, uh, and she said that, I just don't think that girls like it. There's a lot of hard maths in there, and that I think they would rather not, that, they, that I think they would rather not do. The research generally just says that's a natural thing, she said. Now, uh, that caused, uh, well, as a physics teacher yourself, that I would... We'll get into the meat of this in a moment. We'll stick the, the general point. Could the evidence given by Catherine and Burbal Singh have been any more patronising and any more wrong? Well, no. And, and she talked about the research shows. She didn't talk about what research, because I haven't seen research that shows that girls don't tend to fancy it or don't like it. Um, and, and certainly, if I can talk a bit about my experience as a physics teacher, um, Often, the difficulty with girls in physics is, first of all, there's a confidence issue. The, the, the girls don't want to, in a lot of subjects, put themselves forward or put themselves out there. Um, there's a lot of outdated views. It could be coming from home. It could also, unfortunately, sometimes be coming from other teachers about, and they think about how they 
experienced physics and maths and they project those views onto onto the girls that might be considering this but one one of the things that i think is an issue is that there's a lack of female role models that however is changing and as that changes we need to challenge views like catherine burble sings and um, the problem is that you know she she went she gave this evidence she then has uh, doubled down on it and she has kind of tried to defend it by saying this is her experience this is the truth people need to be realistic about it um and i would question really whether somebody with such backdated and um <laughs> as you say patronizing views of girls in physics really should be the chair of the government's social mobility commission good grief it's it's i mean it's it's typical tory um appointment and typical tory uh, views but i i was pretty shocked that in 2022 we're still seeing these views perpetuated well, that's a good point you were making there, Carl, about social conditioning. Uh, Professor Catherine Noakes, who's a mechanical engineer at the University of Leeds, where my stepdaughter is studying, uh, and also a member of the SAGE committee, uh, said that it's really disappointing to see comments like this. Girls are so often told that mathematics, physics and engineering are not for them, and this is conditioned by society. Uh, and in some cases, this includes expectations and attitudes of teachers in schools, but also pervasive toys and clothing that are offered, uh, t t science and technology advice, and a number of things. So, uh, looking a little to the future, and again drawing on your your experience uh, and your your own qualifications uh, as a physicist and former educator, what what should we be doing in Scotland uh, uh, to 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 address these issues? Uh, in a, in a, in addition, and your point about uh, female role models is important. When I saw this story during the week, uh, I made it my point to go and uh, at least mention a, a number of female role models. In addition to that aspect, which is important, what else should we be doing in Scotland to address this issue? Well, a lot of the work has already been done. You know, we're, 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 um, we are looking at gender bias in, in different aspects, but, but you've got to understand it's some of it we can legislate for and some of it is is far more difficult and changing social attitudes can be difficult. Um, I'll, Give you an example i've got three children i've got a boy and i've got two girls now when my boy was born that, that lovely presence and you know lots of nice toys and clothes and everything else that was great um but the the toys and clothes were based on doing things were based on you know um this idea of adventure this idea of of fun and um, when my girls were born it was as though somebody had vomited pink all over my house <laughs> because that's what now again people are very generous and i'm not i'm not being critical of those who buy things like this but from the word go girls are conditioned in a certain way and it's not just about the color pink it's about the messages that are given princess fairy sparkle pretty so we're saying to girls that's the sort of um person that we want you to be if you're not these people that's you know you haven't achieved what we are um, what our aspirations for you and that's when you start thinking of it like that it's it's pretty sinister why aren't girls to be been encouraged to get dirty to get to jump about to play with lego another example i'll give you is my when my my um, older daughter was around about five she asked santa for boys lego because the girls lego why we gender um we have gender specific lego i have no idea but the girls lego was about making house scenes or gardens or flowers or shops whereas the boys lego was planes and boats and cranes and things that moved and did things and she identified pretty quickly that the boys stuff was actually more interesting because it did things and it was um, exciting. Um, so why are we putting, but, but a lot of people do it without even thinking. They don't have any, you know, it's not, there's no sinister intent behind it. However, right from the word go, we're conditioning girls in that way. So by the time they get to school or by the time they get to picking subjects, they've had a decade, over a decade, have been told to think in a particular way and do a particular thing. So schools can only do a certain amount 
to kind of break this back down again and to tackle this. And it's pretty worrying because schools should be trying, should be tackling it, and majority are. Um, it's pretty worrying to see this particular head teacher just accepting everything that has gone on with gender stereotyping and that kind of pervasive uh, messaging that has gone on for so long that she's just accepted and uh, will continue to perpetuate. So so there is a lot of things we should be doing. There's a lot of things, probably things that um, we can look at in, in terms of encouraging numbers into, into subjects like physics and engineering. However, I think society needs to start, we need to start seeing girls doing well in science. We need to start seeing engineers not been shown an engineer is not somebody that comes and fixes your telly or or that gets under the car of uh, the, the does stuff in your car an engineer can be designing things can be working in computers can be out and about can be doing all of these things but we don't have those messages so um we need to think very carefully about messaging that's happening how we're targeting individuals how we're ta targeting not just in the basis of gender, but in the basis of sexuality, in the basis of social demographics, all of these are big, big issues. And um, we certainly shouldn't see head teachers dismissing them as it's just something they don't tend to fancy. Thank you, Carol. Certainly, if anyone wants to to reflect on these things in a in a in an in a, in a very easy kind of manner, the twenty sixteen movie Hidden Figure strike crosses my mind uh, as uh, providing inspiration in all sorts of ways. Uh, and also, I'm I'm reflecting that with uh, as we approach the local elections this week. Uh, in Edinburgh, there are currently two statues of women in the entire city. Uh, there is a campaign by the council led by the Lord Provost to erect a statue to Elsie Ingalls, uh, and that, I hope, will reach fruition in the, in the coming year once the council gets back to business, uh, because there are an awful lot of statues of men in the city, and there are, only, there are more statues of animals in Edinburgh than there are of women, uh, and that needs to change. However, I, I am very mindful that there is a local election campaign underway, uh, and you will have obligations and you will have given commitments to people to be helping with that campaigning today uh, as we as we reach the, the, the final yard. So uh, I think you want to make, make good your escape from uh, the full Scottish today to join folks on the pavements and the front doors in, in Glasgow North. So, Carol, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I, I knew that you would have insight uh, and thoughts on, on each of the stories that we've discussed. We're very grateful to you for your time and your contributions today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Carol. Now, uh, we have one further item for this afternoon, uh, and you'll have noticed that I didn't provide uh, COVID numbers at the beginning of this afternoon's programme, which is something that we've continued to do on the Full Scottish uh, as the pandemic has developed. Uh, but I have the pandemic, I have the COVID numbers, for what I would call the COVID numbers for you now, uh, and I want to share them with you, and then we'll look at a COVID story as well. Uh, so uh, this is the status as at 2 p.m. on Friday last week. Uh, in the past week, 19,605 new COVID-19 cases have been confirmed in Scotland, either with a lateral flow test or a PCR test. Uh, the, uh, that means that 1,435 people were in hospital with recently confirmed COVID-19, 25 of whom were in intensive care. Uh, in the past week, there have been 134 new reported deaths within 28 days of a positive test for COVID-19. Since the start, and that means that since the start of the pandemic, a total of 12,058 patients in Scotland who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died. And 4,389,110 uh, people have now received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination. 4,106,189 have received their second dose. And 3,474,482 ,474 have received a third dose or their booster. Now, having provided you with those uh, COVID numbers for this week, and in particular reflecting on the almost 1,500 people who are in hospital uh, and the 134 who are reported to have died within 28 days of a positive COVID test, uh, I thought it was worthwhile and valuable to talk about uh, the new stay-at-home guidance which has been issued by the Scottish Government in a change to public health guidance. Uh, I have the Scottish Government statement here and I was going to share it with you. Uh, and so from the 1st of May, 
uh, uh, so that's today, public health advice will change to a stay-at-home message for replacing self-isolation for people who have symptoms or who have tested positive for COVID-19. People who have symptoms of COVID-19 and, and who have a fever or are too unwell to carry out normal activities are asked to stay at home. While they are unwell or have a fever, uh, they are no longer advised to seek or take a PCR test. The changes, part of the Test and Protect Transition Plan, uh, which was published last month, will also see the end of contact tracing. As previously announced by the Scottish Government, testing for the general population will end on the has ended on the 30th of April, with test sites closing on that date. However, testing will remain available to certain groups in order to protect high-risk settings, support clinical care, and also for surveillance purposes. These groups include health and social care workers, care home and hospital visitors, patient groups eligible for treatment, hospital patients, unpaid carers, and people in prison. Other adults who have symptoms of COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses and have a high temperature or do not feel well enough to work, uh, to go to work or carry out normal activities are advised to stay at home until their fever has gone or until they feel well enough. Differently, children and young people aged 18 and under with mild symptoms such as a runny nose, sore throat or slight cough and who are otherwise well do not need to stay at home and can continue to attend education settings. They should only stay at home if they are unwell and have a high temperature. They can go back to school, college or childcare and resume normal activities when they no longer have a fever and they feel well enough to attend. Now, this guidance reflects the fact that children and young people generally have a higher likelihood than adults of regular instances of respiratory symptoms from non-COVID illnesses. The Protect Scotland app will be also be closed down shortly. However, users are encouraged to retain to keep the app on their phones in case it is needed again at a future date. NHS, NHS Scotland will also be taken out of an emergency footing at the end of uh, at, uh, last night at midnight as COVID-19 cases continue to fall. However, with continued demands on services across health and social care, there remains a need for caution to protect these vital services. Patients should only attend A&E if their condition is an emergency to continue to limit the pressures on these services. Patients can contact their GP during the day, local pharmacy, or call NHS 24 on 111 as an alternative. The Health Secretary, Hamza Youssef, said, Scotland's Test and Protect programme has been, one of the key, has been one of the key interventions in our response to COVID-19, the, the success of which has been due in no small part to the remarkable staff and volunteers working in Test and Protect. My sincere thanks go to them. I would also like to thank the Scottish public for their commitment and willingness to engage with Test and Protect when it was required of them and helping to protect their fellow citizens. However, we recognise we are now in a different phase of the pandemic. The primary purpose of testing is changing from population-wide testing to reduce transmission to a targeted response focused on reducing severe harm of the virus. As we are now seeking a ready, a, seeing a steady reduction in new COVID cases, the NHS will no longer remain on emergency footing after Saturday the 30th of April, but we must continue with a measured approach to support the recovery and renewal of our NHS. This will require balancing capacity of the NHS and the well-being of the workforce to respond to increasing demands for urgent care while reducing the backlog of planned care. So remember, you can contact your GP during the day, contact your community pharmacist, or contact NHS 24 by dialing 111. But that was our final item this afternoon. In making these programmes... Uh, we will we will now uh, suspend providing COVID figures uh, uh, in these programmes. Uh, so those are the last COVID figures that we will report unless uh, we see a significant change uh, and the issues begin to represent themselves to you. However, that was a, the final item this afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and so in making these programmes, Broadcasting Scotland relies on the financial support of viewers and others who value our distinctive approach to news, current affairs and culture.
if you would like to support us financially, and we really need that support in order to continue what we do and to do more of what we would like to do, then please consider subscribing or donating to Broadcasting Scotland. You will see the link to do that on your screen now. There are other ways in which you can contribute to our work. If you would like to volunteer to work with Broadcasting Scotland, please visit our website at www.broadcastingscotland.scot and send us a message there. I should say, like to say thank you to everyone who's been watching us this afternoon, and I'd like to repeat my thanks to Carol Monaghan MP for joining us today and for her thoughts and her contributions to the programme. I hope that you enjoyed a tasty full Scottish today. Uh, we will be here again tomorrow evening with Scotland at 7, so please join us again then. But in the meantime, please stay warm and stay well. Bye-bye. <laughs>